In today's lesson, we're going over the anti-war movement. So what is the response to the Vietnam War here at home? Because it is fairly unique and has not happened uh, up to this time in the United States. All right, get started writing for one minute. I'll begin explaining as you continue writing. The first thing that's going to cause major issues among the public concerning the Vietnam War or is going to get people out really angry is the draft. So in, during the Vietnam War, particularly after 1965, so after President Lyndon Johnson is in control of the conflict, they pass a Selective Services Act, which is all men 18 or older are eligible to be drafted. Now they don't go too old with it. It's generally up to your early 30s. Um, but is that if your number is called, you either have to show why you can't fight or, uh, or if you have no excuse, then you have to be, you have to be sent over. Um, now, this was not the first draft in the United States history, uh, but with this one, people began to notice some certain trends, which was there were particular groups of people that were being drafted. And part of the reason for this was in Vietnam, you could get out of fighting or being drafted if you were in college. So a lot of college students were able to avoid the draft just by being enrolled at school. And not, it's, not as much as it is today, but back then, is school still wasn't free. So those people that couldn't afford to go to college or graduate school, they were free to be picked from. So people started noticing that it was poor Americans, low-income Americans, which that included poor whites, African Americans, Lat Latin Americans, um, predominantly people of color and people from low-income areas. So this leads to people protesting against the war. And with that, they, um, excuse me, they decide that they're going to take to the streets, they're going to do all these various uh, different forms of protesting that have been popular during the Civil Rights Movement. Um, and so that just sort of seamlessly moves from one movement into another one. Um, and again, the first it starts with uh, the wrong people being drafted, then it moves into the crimes that the public sees that the uh, Johnson administration is having our military commit over in Vietnam. And the last part about like the continuation of the civil rights movement is we still are faced with this idea that we're going into a foreign country trying to fight for a group of people's rights when we still do not have equal rights at home. Uh, and then the other thing of note about the protests is what took place on college campuses. Um, so those people who were exempt from the draft still were arguing against it. So this is one of those moments where uh, things don't exactly line up the way that the uh, U.S. government think, thinks is going to happen. So even though those people are exempt from the draft, they're still protesting against it. And you have uh, protests by college students from pickets to sit-ins to um, deciding that they're just not going to show up for class. 
Then you also have college faculties. Uh, the professors and the administrators decide that they want to protest the war because they don't feel that young men should be sent off uh, to be injured or to die uh, when we have so many problems here at home. And this all kind of just builds and builds and builds and you get to an event like what happens at Kent State University where there's a student protest going on, the governor sends in the National Guard to break up the protest, and through various different mistakes and things like that, the National Guard actually opens fire on the student body and kills four of them. And this is a huge catastrophe for the United States because it's showing this disconnect between the people who disagree with the war and the people who are managing the war. And this is going to further propel the protest movement against Vietnam even further, particularly when you have people dying on college campuses. Same as when people saw African Americans being mistreated by local police department and even National Guard on television, that kind of shifted the, the weight of the civil rights movement in the United States. Now, during this time, Congress decides that they are going to propose what becomes the 26th Amendment, which is changing the voting age from 21 to 18, which is why many of you all uh, next year, we're going to make sure that you get registered to vote. And if you do turn 18 before the election, you will be eligible to vote in your first presidential election. But that aside, this came about because of the protest movements. A lot of, one of the key arguments that the people protesting against the draft and the war were saying is, why is it you're old enough to be shipped off to another country to possibly die, and yet you can't vote at home? You don't have a say in your government. So that's why the 26th Amendment was proposed, and it was unanimously passed fairly quickly. Normally, in an amendment process, can take years, it can, in some cases, it's taken over a century, and yet this one went through really quickly because the, the people of the United States or the states within the United States realized that if you are going to say that you're gonna, you have to serve in the military and you have to be sent off to this country to fight, you should be able to have the ability to vote. Uh, and of course, that's 18 for all eligible voters. So that's women included as well as, uh, as, as people of color. So even though that's a positive that comes out of this, there is still a growing uh, problem that the United States government is facing in that what people are understanding about the war is not matching up with what the government is telling them about the war. And this is a key element. So while this Vietnam was not the first war that the national news media covered, it's the first one that they literally broadcasted every night from the, from, I don't want to say front lines, but from the, from the actual war itself. And this was a, a key element in the Vietnam War and how people understood it because the nightly news, whether that was uh, on any one of the three main broadcast channels back then, 
uh, the nightly news told a completely different story. It showed soldiers struggling to adapt to the environment. It showed, they told stories of things like the My Lai Massacre, which we talked, learned about in the previous lesson. Um, and while they're seeing that and hearing that on the news or reading about it in newspapers, the government's telling them everything's going great, war should be over really soon, so on and so forth. So this creates what's called a credibility gap in the United States. People are beginning to distrust the government because they are realizing or they are suspecting that the government is lying to them. Um, and that, that again leads to and adds to this uh, fury against the war and, and, and feeds into the protest movement. Now, while all this is going on, the United States is, con uh, remember, they are now the primary fighting force in, in South Vietnam, fighting against the uh, National Vietnamese or North Vietnamese Army and the Viet Cong in, in South Vietnam. So, and of course, the uh, White House is telling everybody how great it's going and, you know, war should be over really quick. This culminates with what's called the Tet Offensive, in which the North Vietnamese Army and the Viet Cong launch this large-scale assault throughout South Vietnam on uh, U.S. troops and, and U.S. base, or military bases, so on and so forth. Um, so this also showed the problem that the U.S. military had, which was that they weren't as informed as they thought they were. So Tet is the Lunar New Year for, v or for Vietnam. Uh, so same as on January 1st, we all are, you know, December 31st in, at midnight into January 1st, we have a big party celebrating the turn of the new year. The, uh, the Vietnamese people have a different calendar, and so their Lunar New Year is the same thing. So it's a big celebration, and the U.S. military thought that the North Vietnamese Army and the Viet Cong were going to take that time off to celebrate, take a you know, pause fighting, and enjoy themselves. Instead, they decide that they are going to launch this huge assault, trying to, and from the North Vietnamese, it was an attempt to get the United States out of South Vietnam so that they could unite the North and South. Um, and the United States was completely caught by surprise um, to where you know, soldiers, were, uh, soldiers were attacked, bases were attacked. The U.S. Embassy in Saigon, which was the capital of South Vietnam, was bombed and burned. Um, and so when this is reported back in the United States, the American public is kind of going, what's going on? This doesn't make any sense. How come we're hearing this one thing and then all of a sudden every newspaper, no matter what its background, every news organization is telling us that the Vietnamese completely, or North Vietnamese completely caught us by surprise. And it looks like we're not actually winning this war. Then this all becomes an issue in the 1968 presidential campaign which, so for the Republicans, was Richard Nixon what was their nominee. Uh, and that's 
and, and we're going to get to Richard Nixon on the final slide. But the big debate was on, on the Democrat side. President Johnson, because of the backlash against the entire war, decides that he's not going to run for his second term. Uh, he, he was only elected to one term of office. He had about, you know, about a half a year under President Kennedy's first term when he took over. Then he was elected president in 1964, but then he decides in 1968 he knows he's going to lose because nobody, nobody likes what he's done with the Viet Vietnam War. And so he opens that up. And the main candidate that was gaining steam at that time was Robert Kennedy, who's the brother of John F. Kennedy. Uh, and he was winning primaries, gaining votes, and then he's assassinated in Los Angeles, which we've already talked about, um, after winning the California primary. And that sort of, that shuts the Democratic nomination process down until they get to their convention. Our last slide, and we'll wrap up, begin wrapping up in one minute. So the picking of presidential candidates comes to a culmination in Chicago, where that's where uh, every four years, in order to determine who's going to run for president, the different parties get together at a big convention, a big meeting, and they pick who, who they're going to put out there for the American public to vote on. Um, so by the time you get to the Chicago Convention, there's several different people who've kind of thrown their hats into the ring. Um, and the one continuation that they kept from Robert Kennedy's campaign was they've now changed their stance on the Vietnam War. The Democrats are saying, we want to get out of this war. We realize it's a losing battle. We need, it's not our fight because it's actually a civil war between the North and South Vietnamese. And so every candidate that is proposed at the Democratic Convention, they're anti-war. Um, and so out of this process, um, I got the, sorry, I have the wrong name up there, but, um, hold on, I'm just going back in my head. Uh, out of this process, Eugene McCarthy which uh, that'll be in your vocabulary. So uh, George McGovern here is wrong. He was in 1972. I'm sorry, I'm getting my presidential elections mixed up. Eugene McCarthy was the person who ends up getting the nomination. And part of this was because during the Chicago convention, you had a, uh, a bunch of protests going on. Um, a lot of people protesting uh, the, the Democratic convention. And during these protests, the mayor of Chicago sends out the Chicago Police Department to break up these protests, and it ends up like these police beat these people down. And it's all live on national television. So it looks really bad for the Democratic Party. So that's also what propels them and putting forth somebody like Eugene McCarthy, not George McGovern, Eugene McCarthy, to run for president as an anti-war candidate to appease the protesters. So this is a moment in which, um, now Eugene McCarthy does not become president, but this is a moment where a protest movement, again, has significant uh, change occur. And that because of not only their actions, but the notoriety that they gain, they're able to sway an entire political party into selecting a candidate that has a specific position. Um, so, during the election, 
it comes down to it, and Nixon wins in what we would call a landslide. Now, it's not as much as he's going to get in 1972 when he goes up, up against actual George McGovern, but, and we'll get to that when we talk about Richard, Richard Nixon, but part of the reason he won was that he appealed not only to conservative voters, but he appealed to Southern voters, and he's going to continue that idea. Uh, but the people that he called the silent majority, the people who weren't out there protesting, so he was very big on, he was not about withdrawing from Vietnam, he was about, we're going to win Vietnam. And then at the same time, he was throwing in these subtle hints that he was going to do things to kind of stem the, the tide of all these protest movements, and as well to kind of bring an end to the civil rights movement himself. And again, we're going to get to that much later when we talk about President Nixon and his time in office. And we're going to leave it there.